Good evening and welcome to really our fourth session on reteaching the faith. Now this week we're looking at the fourth article of the Apostles' Creed, which states, He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. As always, I'm going to start with a question to kind of dwell upon, and that is, how many people are named in the Apostles' Creed? Take a few moments. You know the answer? Minus the three persons of the Trinity, when it comes to just humans, just fully human, not fully human and divine, there are only two. The first we heard of last week, the Virgin Mary, and this week we have Pontius Pilate. And we're going to get further into exactly what that does for us and why Pilate is mentioned. But it is interesting that Pilate is here. Because we could go through other creeds, and some, like the Nicene Creed, Pilate is mentioned, but if you look at the Athanasian Creed, or the Statement of Faith of the United Church of Canada, the Statement of Faith of the Korean Methodist Church, just to name three, Pilate is not mentioned. And there is a good reason for that. It does create an interesting contrast between Pilate and Mary. Mary is the grace-filled servant of God, unlike Pilate. And this is something that's important to note. This is what Dr. Timothy Tennant notes in the main book we're using, Foundations of the Christian Faith. In this he writes, Pilate is a defined, known figure in human history who made specific choices that unwittingly lent his support to satanic principles and powers arrayed in opposition to God and his people. Jesus did not suffer in some ephemeral way or on some supernatural plane. Jesus suffered in real history. He was delivered over to crucifixion by the instrumentality of a, a whole range of human decisions to participate in evil, including religious and political leaders such as Pontius Pilate. Just as Mary's presence in the creed calls to mind the power of human choices to obey, the inclusion of Pilate in the creed reminds us of the awesome consequences when we will make decisions opposing God's will. So let's really just unpack that for a moment. There was a lot of words that Dr. Tennant used. But really, it comes down to the contrast between Mary and Pilate. Mary was a great-filled, humble servant of God who chose to follow God's will. Pilate is the opposite. Pilate chose to follow the ways of the world and act, even unwittingly, in opposition to God. And we can even look at it this way. With Mary at the birth, we have a willingness to follow God. Pilate is at the death, surrendering to the ways of the world. Of course, the wages of sin are death. You'll hear that again shortly. But this also does cause us in this passage to question why Jesus had to suffer. I mean, we are looking at God. Why couldn't God just forgive? Why couldn't why did God have to go to this extreme? And the Anglican Church in North America in their catechism, which is one of the newest ones that are out there, does note this. Because in response to their question, why did Jesus suffer? They state, Jesus suffered as a sacrifice for our sins so that we could have peace with God, as prophesied in the Old Testament. But he, has pierced, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now that's what they write, but they do base this on Scripture. Because throughout Scripture starting with the prophecies of the coming Messiah through to Jesus' ministry on earth, this is what Christ came on earth to do. 
We can see that in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As we saw previously, that does remind us that Christ's suffering and death was done for our sake to remove our sins. And this is repeated by the Apostle Paul when talking in his letter to the Romans in chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. When we get into what happened, we can go through the whole passion narrative. It's really what, well represented by Pilate, who represents the worldly powers, who brings about the suffering and death of the Messiah, unwittingly, not done on purpose, but at the same time, in doing so, God was still at work through that very suffering and death. But this brings up a nice question for us. And from those two passages of Scripture, we hear about Jesus taking away our sins. That Jesus, our faith in him, takes it away from us. Do you know what theological term that actually is? There's a, it's a two-word term for Christ taking on our sins. I'll give you a moment. You got it, great, but might be a hard one to pick up on. It is Substitutionary atonement. Sometimes it also comes up as penal atonement as part of it. But it is one of the classic doctrines of the faith. And this is what Dr. Tennant notes in his work as well. Where he says, Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for you and me. He took our place. We are sinners, and therefore we have willfully joined in Satan's rebellion against God. Jumping a little bit. Jesus died for our sins as a substitute. Now, I'll be honest, that's not one of the... It is not one of the favored doctrines within modern Christianity, but it is a historic doctrine of the church, and even in our Methodist tradition, we can look back to Wesley who does support the atonement model of salvation, that Jesus Christ took upon our sins and sacrificed himself on our behalf or in our place. And this is heavily supported by Scripture. Because we can look at what happened and we can see that part of this goes to the fact that Jesus Christ, both human and divine, because he's divine, he was full of faithfulness. He was obedient to God. But yet, so, and he could not sin. Unlike what some would try to say that Jesus has to be forgiven of sins, Jesus has never sinned. God cannot sin. But we do. And it's part of the human faith that requires us to learn faithfulness and obedience throughout our human lives from birth until death. And Jesus Christ, we have that example as Jesus was born, was baptized, lived, suffered, and ultimately died. Jesus Christ died our death, and we can follow his example. But one place we really do need him is because we are sinners. Though Jesus lived in solidarity with the human race, he had no sin, but instead voluntarily took on ours. As Paul writes to the, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
that's really why this had to come into being. It had to come into being because Jesus had no sin to pay the price of. Instead, he took on ours through the atonement, taking our place, taking on our sins so that we can be restored to God. And Martin Luther does a good job in kind of explaining this whole thing. And how it was important for us and what his suffering and death at the hands of Pilate truly did. As Luther writes in his larger catechism. So those tyrants and jailers are all expelled now. In their place has come Jesus Christ, Lord of life, righteousness, every blessing and salvation. He has delivered us poor, lost people from hell's jaws and has won us has made us free, and has brought us along into the Father's favor and grace. He has taken us as his own property under his shelter and protection, so that he may govern us by his righteousness, wisdom, power, life, and blessedness. It is through his suffering, his death, his burial, that was done on our behalf, and in faith, Christ still takes on our sins and this is something that's a promise that's still held true for the church today and it's something if you've been with me for communion you've heard me say this as part of our communion liturgy we use in the united methodist church it's a liturgy that this part is found on page 13 in our hymnals which states holy are you and blessed is your son jesus christ by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The words in the communion liturgy say it very clearly, that it's through Christ's suffering, death, and ultimate resurrection that we will get to in a future week, that we are saved not through our works or our own righteousness, but through Christ's own actions. Actions that paid the price for our sin that we can't pay ourselves. And while we can still struggle with the idea of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ and the fact that it's not pleasant, we can't separate it from the meaning of the action itself. And again, turning to the Catechism of the, Lutheran, of the Anglican Church in North America, they have a question, how do Jesus' Jesus's sufferings help you? And in response, they say, Jesus has experienced our sufferings, understands our sorrows, and is able to sympathize with us with our weaknesses. Therefore, I should bear my sufferings with perseverance and hope, for my Savior is with me in them and through them. I will come to know him more fully. Basically, beyond even the forgiveness of our sin, because Christ has gone through our sufferings, understands it, and sympathizes with us. We know Christ is always with us through our own trials in this life and will help us not only get through, but be drawn closer to him. So this article is not the most pleasant. It's about the suffering, death, and burial of Jesus Christ. But in it is where we find hope of salvation, but also strength, for living a faithful life in this world. So at this point, that's it for the week. If you want to do anything, continue to try to work to memorize the creed. That is important. But also, if you want to go a little bit further, look at the passion narrative. And really look at John chapters 18 through 20. That's the full passion narrative and Easter morning. And Easter. And when you're looking at the narrative, look for the signs of hope. Look for where God's love for humanity is on display. And really just look beyond the human suffering for God's great work. Because although it's not the most pleasant areas we can look at, in those passages we find the good news of Jesus Christ. Next week, we will move on to the fifth article 
Another one that's less than pleasant, but important. He descended to the dead. Until then, I'm Pastor Dave, and I hope to see you next week.